I don't really want to start it.
Om na tatra surya bhakti na chandra tarakam nema vidyuto bhanti kuto yamagnihi tameva bhanta manabhati sarvam tasya vasa sarvam idam vivati Om shanti 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 There, within the indivisible self of all living beings, the sun shines not, nor the moon, nor stars, nor fire, nor lightning, much less this tiny mortal flame. That one light shining, all else shines. By its light, all is made radiant. May that light of pure conscious awareness enter into us and permeate us to the very core of our being. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat. Welcome this morning to a very rainy Hawaii. We are turning into live streaming uh, after about a week and a half absence. And we are in the midst of a huge downpour, so we're going to try and make the voice heard today to all of you who are listening. Also, the river in the gully is rumbling nearby, and so it might be hard for us to continue on. I hope we'll be able to be with you for the full half hour or 45 minutes. Sorry, we're a bit late. I was able to read the and preview the questions early. So I find that most of these five questions that have come in from some of the viewers are about work. So that's one of the topics that we have to take up in spiritual life. And so I'm going to actually read two of these questions together to show you the way that people are dealing with action and meditation and dharmic life in the world today. One questioner says, Lately I have found myself caught up in the negative actions of others, primarily at work. It is important to me to come from a place of love and kindness in my work. So when someone makes a poor decision that affects me, I feel bamboozled. I know projection and ego are factors. But how can I redirect or confront ill-spirited events and stay in sattva? Sattva, of course, is balance. Now, another question says, I just got a new job in my chosen career of conservation. I want to make sure that I approach this job dharmically. I think that it would be dharmic to hold an attitude of Bhuta Yagya while doing my work. You have mentioned Bhuta Yagya along with other main yagyas, but I haven't heard much detail about it. Would you say something about it? Well, Bhuta Yagya is sacrifice to the physical beings, to the humans, to the ancestors, and to the animals, and to the insects, plants, everything here in this realm, actually not the ancestors. Um, although they're here and then pass on into another realm, the kingdoms of heaven within us. But these two questions show us how there's a sort of difficulty in bringing dharma into the world, into the workplace, amongst adharmic circumstances and adharmic people. So back to the first question. She wants to know how she can confront ill-spirited events and stay in sattva. Well, that is the one of the sub-purposes of work. Actually, Swami Vivekananda says that all work should be done as worship and we should labor as love. But uh, he also says that work is the midday sun that is burning the very vitals of humanity. So we see here two different kinds of work that are going on, work done for selfish purposes and work done by people who are even-minded and who want to be a benefit to the society and to their family 
and carry on their everyday actions in a in a balanced way so actually the question itself is rather an answer is that not so much how can we confront these ill factors but is that they're going to come and we 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 have to there's going to be no way around it we're going to confront these things so better to confront them with strength and courage and with one's dharma uh, in, in hand which means you're going to have to maintain an a spiritual practice constantly that will keep you in balance because it's all very easy as we know to meditate in a forest or near a waterfall or in a cave uh, when all of the problems of everyday life and especially in the cities and so forth are not around us but when we get in the midst of them it's the real testing ground so we're going to have to put our practice to test then how much how much have we gleaned from our readings and how stable are we in in meditation and and uh, as the second question here proposes um, can we look upon everything as uh, as uh, divinely uh, as, as divine manifestation all buddhas all physical things that are here in this particular realm we have to look upon all of that as as uh, as divine and so when you come to a question about Bhuta Yagya it means Yagya is that word called sacrifice and it's a sort of a lost art Yagya Bhuta Yagya, Pitri Yagya, Deva Yagya, Nara Yagya and these are all sacrifices that the ancients performed so that they made sure that all levels of existence were appeased, uh, that everyone received their their due, what they were due to in their lives and in their in their actions, and uh, then the whole circle of life could go on in harmony, we could carry on our our activities in a in a mode of of love and care, as the first questioner says. So. If you ask about Bhuta Yagya, what should I, she says, what important points should I consider and keep in mind while I practice Bhuta Yagya? So again, reiterating that Bhuta Yagya is sacrifice to all beings here on the planet in this physical realm, then probably the one thing that you're going to have to keep in mind is that all of this is Brahman, as the non dualists would say, Sarvidam Kalvam Sarvidam Brahma all of this is Brahma so we we have to then take the good and the bad as all Brahman too that is basically the divine expression is there in everything so you're going to have to say some things are godlike and some things are devilish but you can never make a separation between God and devil that is, you can't say like the dualists, there's God and then there's the devil, because that's making a separation <clears throat> that is not going to work in your favor when you're trying to think in an equanimous way and stay in sattva. You can say things. there are things that are godlike and things that are devilish, and the devilish things get thee behind me and bring those things that are divine to the fore. But uh, and, and that will help in dharmic work. But you're going to have to take the poison of relativity along with the nectar, as we say. And so, say, Sri Ramakrishna used to say that the snake has poison in it, <coughs> but it doesn't die on account of that poison. So he's meaning that life is an admixture of good and bad, and um, <coughs> we can't have all good or all bad in a world that's an admixture like this, that has come from a mind a great mind that is also an admixture. Uh, so in that way then we're going to have to approach everything under the non-dual axiom all this is Brahman. At the same time then that being the first directive you would use when you put Bhutiyagi into practice 
you're going to have to say that God can't be a form and God can't be characterized by any quality, a quality such as good, and bad, virtue and vice, or any other pair of opposite. So uh, you have to hold this sort of uh, twin stance in the matter that all of this is Brahman, but Brahman can't be a form, it can't be a name, and, and can't be explained or described by qualities or dualities. So it's a rather razor's edge path then, as they say in, in Vedanta, that you hold the ideal of oneness in everything, and then you realize at the same time that um, God exists in a transcendent sense in everything. That is like sweetness shoots through and through sugarcane juice, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that that one non-dual consciousness or Brahman, the presence or the spirit, however you want to call it, is in everything, is in every form. That's Buddha. Those are Buddhas you're talking about. Human bodies, animals, insects, plants are all Buddhas in this case, and you're having to make a great sacrifice to them. So, of course, the, the question says, what should I consider and keep in mind while I practice this? Uh, and uh, and uh, along with the other main yogis, which I mentioned. So, sticking just to Bhuta Yagya, for instance, we know that we take care of the plants, we take care of the environment. Uh, that could be anything from watering our own plants at home uh, so that we provide them with what they need to live. And then taking care of the general environment in your general neighborhood and also the world environment as a collective consciousness. Uh, it's very important that we continue to do that. And then there is the case of animals. Uh, and basically we feel most of us in, in Vedanta and Buddhism and Jainism and other uh, Indian darshanas, those religions, that uh, animals are to be treated reverently and with sensitivity. Um, many of us, therefore, are vegetarian. Um, we won't commit harm against animals, uh, what to speak of insects even, and the environment that everything, if all this is Brahman, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahman, then we don't want to commit any act of violence against it. This is not just a philosophical axiom, but it, it also is a matter of being taking care not to create any karma, uh, any negative karma, from the acts that you do. And uh, therefore one lives very carefully, very consciously, and uh, that is really at the foundation of all the yagyas, bhuta yagya, uh, that is uh, animals, plants, and insects, and so forth, living beings and their bodies, and then nara yagya, humanity itself, and pitra yagya, we keep a mind towards our ancestors and uh, families that we've been born into and who have passed and who have gone to prepare a way for us. Uh, uh, ho hopefully they've lived conscious lives too and uh, that will of course pave that way to the to the light after we drop the body and then there's uh, uh, worship of the gods which some of us are involved in that's called deva yagya deva yagya is important because just as the kingdoms of heaven are within you so are there are deities in each of those heavens within you and those deities need to be appeased too. They need to be satisfied uh, in order for the, them to pave the way inward in your spiritual life. Your spiritual life means not just your daily life, but your meditation, your daily meditation as you try and move inward towards your center, towards your essence, towards your true nature, your swarupa. And so you're going to want to have the right coinage, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, to pay uh, the ferryman, as you move in towards these different inner trajectories or inner worlds, these lokas or these realms. 
So that's by way of analogy or metaphor, but uh, the actual meditation and and your actual sleep tonight, and you're going into dream and you're going into deep sleep and so forth, is is a sort of movement of the mind in the realms of consciousness. My father's mansion has many chambers, uh, has many rooms in it, you see, and uh, those are all rooms of peace and rest and, uh, and sojourn, Christ said. We sojourn amongst those realms. So we want to make sure the way is clear, is kept clear, and that's what yagi or sacrifice is all about. If you, if society or as an individual or as a family, you you lose the art of sacrifice, then it's going to there are going to be many impediments that fall in your way, and you're uh, you're going to lose your way and become confused. Bamboozled is the word that is used just here. See, I feel bamboozled in the workplace when uh, people do errant acts and have errant thoughts and then it affects other people so it really begins with you and you have to be an example for those people who are as yet still making these kinds of errors and if you get off base or off balance then of course it doesn't help anyone you have to uh, do your daily sadhana and, and stay balanced and face off with those and and remain detached and calm is the word here. Uh, there's one more yagya that's very important in the yagyas. That's called rishi yagya. Uh, I think it's probably the most important uh, because the rishis were the great teachers that came to us, and they have left behind sure and certain proofs of God's existence and they have uh, opened our eyes to the teachings, the Dharma, via the scriptures, especially the revealed scriptures. And in that way they deserve all worship. Uh, they are actually residing within us too, just like the gods and goddesses are, and just like the ancestors are, and so are the animals, insects, and plants, and this whole world residing within you. They started out within you, and then they manifested outwardly from your thought process. So the tree is now your thought, your, your object tree, because it started off as a thought tree. So these levels of being that waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, they call them, or we call them uh, stula jagat, sukshma jagat, and karana jagat. That means the gross world, the subtle world, and the causal world are three levels of your consciousness uh, and one's made of matter and one's made of thought and one's made of seed essence, bijams. So as you step inward uh, like that in your meditation or in your contemplation process, say when you pick up a scripture, you're automatically dropping this world and you're going to the second world when you're reading bits of wisdom and you're already living in that sukshma jagat, even though your body is still inhabiting the waking state, you're kind of in a deeper dream state. So making these connections and keeping these connections clear is what's important for the householder uh, and the dharmic practitioner. And sacrifice brings forth the rain too. So they say in the Bhagavad Gita, so we have that coming in droves right now, so maybe if I stop speaking about sacrifice, the rain will quiet down and we'll be able to take some of these other questions. Anyway, some points about yagya, very important word. And bhuta yagya in the workplace means that if I have people who are around me who are not conscious, then I'm going to have to stand up for my self and, uh, and uh, situation to situation make sure that these people know that uh, I'm not in step with adharmic ways, that dharma has to be followed and otherwise it's going to bring a kind of collective karma upon everyone in the workplace. Everyone's going to have to share with it in it just like 
all of us have to share in the world karma on a collective level because of wars, and because of atrocities and bad thoughts. So when you talk about Vedanta and Buddhism and Jainism, they're very nonviolent religions in thought, word, and deed. It might as well be three levels there. You see two, thought, word, and deed. So, I mean, deed would be the, the gross state and thought would be the subtle state and, and word would be the bijam, you see. Uh, the, uh, the seed essence is inside of you, the, the causal state. So, if you want to be nonviolent in thought, word, and deed, uh, as these religions uh, enjoin you to be, then you're going to have to um, maintain that dharmic stance at all three levels. And so that would include the workplace and uh, not just come from a place of love and kindness, but actually stand up for dharmic things and make sure that they're instigated. And if they're not, then I would advise, and I have advised my students to just leave the workplace and find a different place that's more suitable. It's not worth any amount of money, what to speak of your peace of mind, to hold a job where people are constantly living in error and, and contributing to the negative karma of humanity, uh, doing ill-spirited things, I think is what it says here. So what to speak of just confronting them, that's the first step. But if you confront them and there's no change, you see, from that, then you may have to withdraw and find a better workplace. Uh, uh, that's that's uh, maybe there's a better job opportunity waiting for you, and Divine Mother is just actually directing you in that uh, in that way. And that's the next question: How is it that we can be responsible for our state of existence, and yet still not be the doer of our actions? If we are not the doer, then why does sadhana and self-effort lead to purification of mind? Is it in reality just the grace of the mother playing through us? Well, actually, when the, the, the grace of the Divine Mother does play through you, then you will know that you're not the doer of your actions. Not until. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna used to be fairly certain certain uh, about that and make adamant statements about that, that being the non-doer is a very, very high station of awareness. It's not something that you can just jump to or merely say, give lip service to, and then start doing and get all involved in karma and, and then step back and solve and say, well, I'm not the doer of my actions. That's an admixture, an unhealthy admixture of things. In order to really know that you're not the doer of your actions is to have meditated and reached a state where you see action and inaction and inaction in action as Krishna puts it in the Gita which is one of those <coughs> very uh, difficult verses or slokas in the Gita to understand <coughs> so if you have somebody like the case of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa into whom Mother Kali manifested herself <coughs> Excuse me. Then you have a person who is manifesting the divine in every thought, word, and deed, and uh, it <coughs> is really living in a state of, of inaction. And then, even when a person such as that goes into the acts of everyday life, they're not bringing any. Uh, untoward karma forward or they have any to remove. In fact, they can help remove the karmas of others as he did so well with the people that came to him there in Bengal in, in the 1800s when he lived. <coughs> so when Divine Mother does actually descend into the human form in a conscious way, then that's the reign of grace falling. <coughs> And all we need to do is raise our sail to catch that wind of grace that's always blowing, Sri Ramakrishna said. And when that happens, then we may get a glimpse of being, not being the doer of our actions, that something else is working through us. But that only comes in increments at first. You get little glimpses of it, and you feel it like an intuition. 
And in fact, I had just last week one teenage uh, girl write to me, one of our students, and say I was going about the city and the town doing my everyday work and all of a sudden I felt like I was outside and detached from myself and that the body was just being going its various ways and I was completely outside of it and looking on. <clears throat> and I wrote her back and said, yes, that happens in spiritual life that people have those glimpses of, of witness consciousness. It's called Sakshi Bhutam. Bhutta is that Bhutta Yagya we were just talking about sacrifice to beings. So Sakshi Bhutta would mean you're the witness of those things. You're the witness of all the insects and animals and plants and, and so forth. And most, most often people are engrossed in them, see, so they're so engrossed in everyday life that every little thing will affect them. But the beautiful thing about detachment that would lead to a state of witness consciousness, or I am not the doer of my actions, is that you get uninvolved from these things. You disinvolve, you disenchant yourself from trees and, and species and oceans and all the study of this maya, this physical maya, the, the realm of the Buddhas. You actually disenchant yourself of it and then you start to get a taste of what it's like to look on from, uh, from a detached witness standpoint. And that's where bliss is, and that's where peace is. We can start out with calm, and then we can get quietude, and then we can get silence, and then we can get equanimity, and then finally we can get peace, see. But then you're headed toward the peace that passes all understanding. And uh, so these inward steps of, of, of calm and quietude and so forth will begin to lead you toward that witness consciousness and basically it's just looking on the mind looking out upon everything that it projected and but it doesn't lose track of the source from which it got projected it, it is the source it's the original mind and it sees clearly now that all of that has come from this purnamadaha purnamidam purnat purnamadachate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva vashishyate all of that has come from fullness. Purna, purna, purna means fullness. That fullness out there, uh, with its emptiness, <laughs> has come from this fullness in here, which is absolute fullness, unchangeable fullness, complete, fulfilling, unmoving, all-pervasive. In fact, so all-pervasive that this has become that and that has become this. So that's the state of witness consciousness which gives you peace, shanti, and bliss, ananda. And that's what the seers are experiencing all the time, which most people don't have. And why they would begin to question about it, because they feel peace and bliss somewhere in the equation. But they're, they're going to have to return to yagya, you see, making sacrifice, Actually, making sacrifice isn't just like uh, watering a plant or, or sacrificing a goat at a temple or something. You see, uh, these different kinds of ideas people have. Really, sacrifice is just becoming aware and treating everything with reverence. And it'll have to start off with nonviolence. I have to quit committing offense against things long enough so that some of this peace, and this bliss, and this witness consciousness can, it, can suggest itself to your thinking process, to your mind. Just quit committing violence in thought, word, and deed long enough so that that peace and bliss can suggest itself again to you, to your mind. Uh, and then you'll know what r return is, return to your essence or to your source is all about. And until then, you're so involved with outward things, workplace, environment, various, various other things, that you've lost all contact with that source and with that essence. And you're going to have to stop and become inactive and withdraw, become peaceful, and become sattvic, as the word is used here, balanced. And stay there long enough until you regain yourself, 
regain your balance. And that's just all this art of spiritual life right there. Practicing the Dharma will help very much. Taking the teachings will help very much. Meditation will help very much. And offering a, offering a flower to the deity on the altar will help very much. See, but nothing will, will do it as much as your own willingness to, to actually bring such a state of existence into your everyday life, into your everyday moment. So, grace of the Divine Mother makes it all easy, but who gets that? And of those who do, how often do they get that? Very seldom, the seers say. So in that case, we have to be our own grace. We, we want to be examples, exemplars. We don't want to be bound. So we need to instigate that those kinds of uh, higher qualities into our everyday life and into our thinking process and until those things begin to leach into our everyday life. Right now, the things that are leaching into our everyday life are, are our violent tendencies and, and our evil thoughts and evil words and evil deeds or admixtures of the same. But where are all the good things that are coming forth from our sadhana? Sadhana means our spiritual practice or the four yogas. Where are those things? When are they going to become evident in our everyday life? So, uh, being the doer of your action is okay, uh, but you want to be the doer of dharmic action. Until being a non-doer can suggest itself to you, it's a very high state. And so, a question like this sort of uh, belies that. See, it makes it too black and white. You've got to rem remember that uh, by, by stages, a spiritual practitioner moves inside and acclimatizes him or herself to these deeper regions of consciousness. And then things like non-doership will happen by increments in little glimpses. In the meantime, your business is just to make sure that your actions are dharmic. And you can be the doer of your actions. In fact, you'll have to be the doer of your actions as long as that's going on, that kind of process. You just don't want to be the doer of negative actions. So I hope that clarifies it a little bit more. Make sure you make this distinction between uh, ill-advised actions, dharmic actions, and non-action. There's a big chasm between all three. It's not just so, so easily defined, you see. Non-doership is very, very high. We started late because of the rain, which is still trying to drown us out, but uh, we are coping as best as we can. And we have one question here. When meditating on one of the gross elements, such as earth, what connections are to be made? Are we just trying to recognize their unreality, detach and renounce them, and then dissolve them back into the senses? Talking about the five elements, air, earth, fire, water, ether, or in gross to subtle, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, and how they connect to the five senses of uh, tasting, uh, smelling, uh, seeing, touching, and hearing in order, in respective order like that. That is, when you meditate yogic style, then you have to understand that the element earth goes with the sense of smell, basically, and water goes with taste and light. Uh, that is, uh, fire goes with eyes. You make those general connections and then these two quintuplications come together. Uh, like, just like this, isn't it? Five and five. See how these come together so nicely? So five into five. Uh, 
And uh, then you all of a sudden have a connected Buddha Kasha. So the realm of the Buddhas is all of a sudden connected. I just said that from the interior, the exterior has come. Purnamadaha, it's all full. Uh, but that's a kind of jump to the chase statement. That's a very high statement again, but if you want to get down into the nitty gritty dynamics of how it happens, the meditator will have to take this seemingly variegated and far-flung creation and begin to connect elements of it. See? Just like you would tie uh, strings together from different directions. So the thing about the five senses and the five elements is they're already tied. You don't need to tie them up. In fact, eventually you're going to have to untie them. <laughs> but you have to tie them first. That is, you have to know that they are tied. That is, that earth came from smell and water came from taste and so forth. Uh, that's the order of things. It's not something that, you know, yes, you're going to have to reverse the process. The chain of evolutes has gone out, but the chain of evolutes also must be connected back in. That's called the, we've been calling that lately, the dissolution of the mind stream meditation. The mind stream out in fives, and now it's got to be drawn back by my own willpower. Then the class today, the first class in the series today, uh, live streaming class, will be on dissolving the mind stream in Sankhya Yoga which is one of the earliest ways in which they conceived of it, the five quintuplication processes. Pancha, karana, they call it. So making these connections then consciously, because they already are connected, but your, your consciousness isn't there thinking about it. You're not thinking that water goes with taste and earth goes with smell. You're just experiencing water and experiencing smell, or experiencing earth and experiencing uh, 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 these five elements as separate from each other and as separate from your senses. They only come in contact with each other when you want to enjoy, you see, or when you want to satisfy hunger or thirst, earth and water, right? But now you have to bring them together as companions in life, uh, always interrelated companions that they always were connected, but you fell out of connection with them, fell out of consciousness of the connections. So, with that kind of introductory background, then this question makes a little bit more sense to those of us looking on. Um, what are the connections to be made? Those precise connections. If you want to specify just earth with a smell, then you're going to want to meditate on earth in every way you can possibly think of it. Uh, all the metals, all the woods, uh, all the different kinds of chemicals and, and soil and planets in space, those are all earth, aren't they? So you can see how far ranging earth is. So you get this massive view of what earth is and also microscopic view of what Earth is. Inside of a little handful of dirt, there are all these po energies and powers, shaktis, so you're running around in this little tiny handful of Earth. So from the microcosmic to the macrocosmic, you try and meditate on Earth as a, as a ground. You take Earth as a ground for your meditation. Uh, <clears throat> you may have been meditating on light, or you may have been meditating on Buddha, or Krishna, or Ramakrishna, but for this particular meditation, to make the connections clear to you, you want to meditate on earth in as many ways as you possibly can. And then the question is, are we just trying to recognize their unreality, detach and, dis and renounce them? Well, I would say that that sort of happens naturally when you see when you meditate upon earth and see how it changes, how there can be landslides, how there can be suns that explode or planets that, that get destroyed, uh, that there's this process of, of 
creation, preservation, and destruction going on all the time in the realm of the Bhutas. You see, that's, you did the Bhuta Yagya. So, you know, you were reverently treating everything. Well, it's the same way then with this meditation. Uh, it's not just to see the unreality of it, but it's to make the connection that it has come from within you. Earth has come from within you. How do I get there from this broad meditation or this microscopic meditation that I've just taken up? I get there by meditating on Earth in my dream. Now I have to take everything that I just saw outwardly and meditate on it in a dream. Earth in a dream. Probably have to start meditating on water here very seriously because we might get washed away. Outside the gully is rumbling like thunder. It's actually shaking the house, so we're in a sort of Noah's Ark position right here. But we're still broadcasting as much as we can to try and tell you about these five elements that are all around you. So this, these connections that you made, it's not just to dissolve them back into your senses, because your senses shut down in dream, right? When you, go, when you leave the waking state, you leave the bhutakasha, and the senses shut down. So now you have subtle senses in your dream. And earth in a dream and you have smell in a dream and now you want to meditate on earth there in that subtle state and you see what's happening here is you're beginning to allocate the first world to the second the a of om to the u of om you, know, you have to connect the three matras right of om a u and m You've heard that teaching. If you leave A, U, and M, that is projection, sustenance, and withdrawal separate, then you never have a comprehensive or cohesive realization of who you are and that the Word is within you and the Word was in the beginning and it was with God and all of that. So you never get there, you see. So by making these connections in this way, then all of a sudden, you, ha you understand earth and you understand smell as they connect at two different states of your awareness, waking and dreaming. Now, the marvelous thing is that how they all disappear in deep sleep. That's the final mode of meditation in this particular kind of meditation called alum alumbanic or alumbanas. Father of Yoga wants you to do this kind of meditation so that that you know the kingdoms of heaven are within you and you know that all of this has come from within you. And now all of a sudden you're having this these realizations because you're actually involved in the process yourself. So, so the causal state, Karna Jagat, the causal world is formless. That's where the seeds are to everything, the bijams. Thought was the second world, and the, and the first world was, was matter. Matter, thought, and seed essence. So now you know your three worlds because you've traced the sense earth to smell, and s earth and smell in a gross state to earth and smell in a subtle state, and then watched how earth and smell went away totally in your causal state. So now you've actually taken a journey back inside of yourself, the three levels of your own being, the AUM of OM, the waking, dreaming, and deep sleep state, the gross, subtle, and causal worlds. Now you have to do the same with water and taste, and then fire and sight, 
and then touch and air, and then hearing and ether. This is a comprehensive meditation which will put to rest all doubts, so there's one answer to your question, and will destroy all ignorance because of knowledge. And you're doing it all by connection. So I would say it may be a little bit uh, extreme, let's use that, to detach and renounce and, and look at the elements and the senses as unreal. That's, that's for advanced beings to do that. Beings who have already done the process. You see, if, if a great soul is born in the world, he already knows the world's unreal. Other people, by the thousands, are trying to prove to themselves that the world's unreal. Other people, by the millions, don't care if the world's real or not. They just, they love the unreality of the world. <coughs> They're in samsara, but the great soul's in nirvana. So they already know. They don't have to make the connections. They're not here for that kind of sadhana or for that kind of work. They're here to help you with, with doing the same. So they can say, oh, I renounce it. I'm detached from it and I renounce them completely and it's all unreal. They can say that, but you can't say that. That's, that's just you trying to mimic a great soul. But you have to follow a great soul. A great soul is not your savior. A great soul is your exemplar. So I am the, I am the way and the truth and the life, you see. So you have to take that life and you have to emulate it. And this is one of the ways in which you would do it. You would follow the footsteps of the great seers. They took air, earth, fire, water, and ether, and they dissolved it into the senses, and they dissolved those into the dream state, and the dream state into the formless causal state called deep sleep. And then they dissolved that, all of that back into Brahman, or into the word. And they found the word inside of themselves. And when, they, when the word was with God, they came out and saw all the worlds. And when the word was God, they went in and became one with God. I and my Father are one. So this coming out and coming in, this projection and this withdrawal, and the period of sustenance that lies between them, is another one of these great triputis. So I would say then, to wrap up our satsang on this rainy morning, that uh, think more in terms of dissolving them in order to have made the connections and then finally to have mastered them via destroying the ignorance that exists around them and ending up in knowledge. When you know all of that that's out there, has come from you, then uh, you're in a state of enlightenment. You're in a state of peace. And it won't be long before the peace that passes all understanding will attend upon you and your mind. So here, let's end with a chant. <coughs> Om Masato Ma Sadgamaya, Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityor Ma Amritam Gamaya, Abhira Abhira Mayeti Rudrayate Dakshina Mukam Tenamam Pahinicham, Om Shanti 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 Hi. <coughs> Lead us from darkness to light, from lower truth to higher truth, from the unreal to the real, and from the illusion of death to eternal life. Reach us through and through, O Lord and Mother, with thy sweet and benign presence. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om, Hari Om Tat Sat. <coughs>